Welcome to our 23rd annual Jewish Book Festival, sponsored by the Jewish Federation of the San Gabriel and Pomona Valley. My name is Denise Schaefer, and I'm one of the members of the organizing committee and your moder moderator for this evening. There's a tremendous amount of effort and commitment that it takes to create this festival. So before we start our program, I'd like to acknowledge all the people involved. Thank you to our hardworking committee members and our first time chair this year, Linda Mazur, our advanced readers, the Federation staff and our coordinator, Kim Banaji, the Jewish Book Council in New York, our behind the scenes tech wizard, Jake Tavel, and our literary circle members whose financial support make this entire festival possible. This evening's program will be a moderated conversation. I'll start by asking our guest author some questions to learn about her book, and then you'll have a chance to ask some questions as well. To do so, go to the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and type them in at any time. Now it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's author. Jan Eliasberg is an award-winning and prolific film and TV director, producer, and screenwriter. Her directing career includes dramatic pilots, such as Miami Vice and Wise Guy, countless episodes of television, including NCIS Los Angeles, Parenthood, Bull, and 13 Reasons Why, just to name a few. She's a graduate of Wesleyan University and has two MFAs from the Yale School of Drama and Directing and from the Warren Wilson College Program for Writers in Fiction. Hannah's War, published in March of 2020, is her debut novel and was a National Jewish Book Award finalist. She's lived in Los Angeles and is very familiar with the Pasadena area and Romans. She's coming to us tonight from New York City. So welcome, Jan. Thank you so much. It's lovely to be here, sort of. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> well, we're excited to have you join us and congratulations on your first novel. Thank you very much. So I thought we can start off, if you can start by setting the stage and introducing us to Hannah, the main character of your story. Absolutely. So um, the story introduces Hannah as a scientist who is standing um, in what I describe as almost a barracks, a prison cell, staring off into uh, across the desert. And um, you realize that she is in fact uh, working at the center of the Los Alamos team headed by uh, J. Robert Oppenheimer, working toward the Trinity test, which is the first test of the atomic bomb. Um, I discovered Hannah um, when I was doing research for a script I was writing about the women air service pilots in World War II. And I was reading the New York Times, uh, the issue that was published on the day they announced that we had bombed uh, Hiroshima in Japan. And as I was reading this uh, sort of wrap up article where the Times was telling the world how this bomb had come to be, I saw below the fold a paragraph that said the key component that allowed the allies to develop the bomb was brought to the allies by a female non-Aryan physicist. And I, in that moment, sat up, practically spoke aloud, but it was the library. So I, I think I just spoke to myself, who is this woman? Why do I not know her name? Why isn't she staring out of every science and history textbook we have? I know she's got an incredible story, and I know that I am the person who's going to tell it. And that was about 12 years ago. So it's taken me a while to figure out exactly how and in what form, but that is the woman that I place in Los Alamos in that uh, surrounded by barbed wire uh, scientific laboratory.
Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, why did you decide not to write a biography of Dr. Meitner? So um, it was really interesting because I had certain ideas that must have flashed in my mind when I read this mysterious woman with no name. And when I discovered the woman herself, she was quite extraordinary. Um, but her life was not exactly what I had imagined when I was prompted by that, that idea. There were many extraordinary things about her. Um, and, and really, you know, among them is the fact that she really should have been awarded a Nobel Prize for the discovery of nuclear fission. Um, but I had become already quite interested in what America was doing at Los Alamos. And so I felt that just to tell the story of this woman in Berlin was not quite enough for the scope of the book I wanted to write, which included a lot of what was going on at Los Alamos and in America. And so I took a lot of details about her life in Berlin, but I changed her name. And um, I think, you know, basically fiction begins when you change the names um, mm -hmm. and suddenly she was free to become not Dr. Lisa Meitner, but Dr. Hannah Weiss. And um, there is a very good biography of her uh, that mm -hmm. has been written um, by uh, uh, Helen Lewin Syme, who teaches at Sacramento or used to, I think she's emeritus now. Um, and I felt that that as a fiction writer, my, my part of this was to tell this story that I began to weave together that involved her, but also several other characters that became very prominent in the story. So I, I, your career has been spent so far as a screenwriter. Why a novel? What was the, what does the novel format give you other than um, a screenplay? Well, so, as you said, I do have an MFA in fiction. Um, I had longed to write a novel for a long time. Um, I had been a little daunted, frankly, by the, um, the challenge of it and the isolation of it. Uh, directing and, you know, directing is a very collaborative form. And I had certain skills as a director that, um, allowed me to tell stories through other people and through sound and visuals and camera and music and all of the, all of the huge toolbox that you get as a, as a film director. But I, I've always been a voracious reader and I felt that I was telling the story of a woman who had been erased from history. And I thought if I write a screenplay that doesn't become a film, I will be erasing her yet again. Mm -hmm. And I cannot do that. <laughs> and I must, I must tell this story in, in, in a way that gets uh, seen and, and understood. And so film is a difficult, it's a difficult thing to do. It's a difficult enterprise to raise money for. And I have had wonderful screenplays and have read other people's wonderful screenplays that don't get made into films. I also felt that this character of Hannah is keeping a lot of secrets. It is an espionage thriller. She is a suspected spy. Um, and she is up to some things that she has to be very careful about guarding. And so I thought a character like that might not be likable, which is a word you hear a lot in Hollywood, particularly about women characters. They have to be likable, which often means they have to be perky and bubbly and attractive. And they have to be played by, I don't know, um, you know, some fill in the blank actress. 
<laughs> and I just felt like Hannah was not going to be necessarily, I knew she would be likable in the end because as you unravel her story, you see what she's doing and why she's doing it. But I wasn't sure uh, that you would necessarily see that in a film right away. And so when I thought about it, the first words that came into my mind were, were, were Hannah's words, first person. And I realized, oh, that's the gift of writing a novel. <laughs> I, I can get right into her head. I can put the reader in her head by giving you what she's thinking. I can't do that in film, except for voiceover, which is never, you know, it's it, if you have a lot of voiceover in a film, it's usually a sign the film isn't quite working um, as well as it should be. So that was, that was a lot of the reason. And I, I, I felt, I remember thinking, you know, Emma Bovary, Anna Karenina, these are not necessarily likable characters, but you love them. Mm -hmm. And that was really where I thought Hannah would kind of, you know, would kind of live. And um, so, yes, so that, that, that's why. But, but there's a possibility that it will become a film now. Mm -hmm. And so I'm hoping will be able to try I will be able to translate all of those things that I've come to love about her and an actress will be able to allow you in in the same way that the voiceover does in the book that makes sense yeah have you started the screenplay yet um, or just well, I have <laughs> okay yes. on the to-do list <laughs> um, I've done a first draft but given that I wrote probably 50 drafts of of the book um, the first draft is not going to be the last, so. Right. Well, one of the things that um, you do well in the book via Hannah's voice is translating very complex scientific theories to um, show her brilliance. How did you approach understanding all these exper uh, experiments and that are really integral to the whole story. Um, what kind of research and what was your biggest challenge in doing so? Great question. Um, so anybody who knows me from grade school will know that math and science were not my best subjects. Um, so I found my way into the story through the, the idea of this woman in history. And um, at a certain point I realized oh my God, I, I'm going to have to teach myself physics in order to actually write this because that's what she's doing for most of the, the time in the book. She's actually doing experiments. Um, and what I realized when I talked to a lot of scientists, that was the first thing. And um, I realized a couple of things that were interesting. One was all, almost every scientist you talk to plays an instrument. They're very, very connected to music. And so the idea of science as, a, as an art form gave me a way in because of course I'm, you know, I'm an artist myself. Um, I'm a woman also in a world that has a lot of men in it, so I, so I understood that part of the process. But then I also realized that that collaboration in science is like falling in love. And so the intensity of work when you are onto an idea and you cannot wait, you, you, you are so blinkered into finding out the truth that everything else just fades away. I understood that really well. So I felt like I could, I could really, uh, I could describe that. I could put the viewer, the reader in that situation. I would say too, that I was influenced by the fact that in the book, the, the character who comes into the book kind of as the reader's point of view 
is a is a, 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 a his name is Jack. He's a member of the OSS, and he comes in to investigate a leak, a potential leak, and to find a spy at Los Alamos. And he doesn't know anything about science, so I thought, well, if he's if he's the reader, he's going to be asking the kinds of questions that the reader would ask, and. I personally love it in films and television and books when a very complicated subject is explained in a way that anybody can understand. And to give you an idea, you know, if, if you remember A Beautiful Mind, there, there was a scene in which they explained game theory when Russell Crowe and all his buddies were at a bar and the Russell Crowe's theory was, well, you don't send the best looking guy to pick up the best looking girl because then they go off together and everyone else gets left out. Mm -hmm. So you send the least best looking guy and then everybody kind of mingles together. And that was game theory. So I thought if I can find things like that, that, for example, people of course, you want to know what, what is nuclear fission? What is splitting the atom, actually? And so I came up with a scene where Hannah asks Jack to throw a stone into a tree. And all of these birds fly out of the tree. And she says, so you don't see the birds when they're in the tree. We don't see the atom split. What we see is the energy that's released as the birds fly out of the tree. We measure that energy, and that's how we know what we did. And so just things like that that I felt will sort of give you an idea into the way these scientists think. I, I, hope, I mean, I found them wonderful sort of to come up with those scenes and to write them. Um, was exciting to me. I hope they're exciting to other people reading. I hope people go away feeling like they really understand something about nuclear fission um, and bomb that they didn't know before. It, but it's not, you know, it's not, it's not homework reading this book. I, I just have to say, it's not like having some difficult test to prepare for. <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> Well, I remember that tree explanation, and I thought it was such a great visual to explain some very complicated theories. Um, when you were doing your research, um, especially about the Manhattan Project, was there anything that surprised you from? So you... much, so much. And this really fueled my decision to make the book about more than just this woman. Um, I discovered, first of all, I discovered that there, there is a kind of myth, I think, that we have all been fed and we mostly want to believe um, that, you know, the Germans were these terrible anti-Semitic people and we Americans rode into World War II like the white knight you know, well, democracy rules and, and we save the day. And the truth is, I discovered in my research that a lot of Hitler's theories came from Henry Ford, our industrialist, who published um, The Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which is a very discredited book, but the book that is still the sort of underpinning foundation of anti-Semitism. He published that in the Dearborn Gazette, which was one of his newspapers in Dearborn, Michigan. And Hitler actually thanks him mm -hmm. in Mein Kampf for the, these ideas. Um, he also, Henry Ford, volunteered to turn his uh, assembly lines over to the German military for production of weapons. So I discovered that anti-Semitism was, was far more pervasive in America than I had ever imagined. And um, that 
what I had seen in the initial idea of this Jewish woman working in Berlin and so excited about the theories and the work she was doing and her collaboration that she was able to kind of not see a lot of the realities of, of national socialism because she was just working and excited about her work. So in the end, what happens to Hannah in Germany is that she is told by all her colleagues who are Aryan, don't worry, you know, you're working at this, this huge research institute, the Nazis can't touch you, you'll be safe, we'll protect you, you have all these exemptions. And when Austria was annexed, she was suddenly just a Jew. And she had to escape with six hours to, before she was taken away. And in fact, one of the professors at Kaiser Wilhelm where she was teaching called the Gestapo and told them where she was. So she had seen what happens when pure science is militarized. Suddenly this beautiful research institute was taken over by the military and all they cared about was weapons, military weapons. All of this research, the scientific research became totally focused on winning the war. Now you put her at Los Alamos and she sees the same thing happening. The scientists working on the bomb were again so intent on the goal and they had all been brought together, these geniuses of the world, and they were given conditions to work and to collaborate and to think, and they didn't see the bigger picture, which was that the military was really controlling the work. And once they got close enough to having the bomb, they no longer had any say over how it was used. It was taken away from them and it, it was in the hands of President Truman and the military. And many, many, many scientists, and I don't know that this surprised me, but it moved me. Many, many scientists really were, were almost pained by the realization that they had worked on this weapon without really thinking about the consequences of what they were letting into the world. And by the time they realized the real consequences, which was the Trinity test, when, the, when it worked, right, it was too late, then they were no longer necessary. So nobody, nobody needed to listen to them anymore. And that, I, I found that very powerful and very, important to think about because the truth is that Hannah has been through that situation before. She has seen it happen in Germany. And so when she's in Los Alamos, she's seeing it with a, a wider view than a lot of the other scientists. And that informs her choices um, in the story. Um, I don't want to give too much, I don't want to spread, <laughs> but yeah. So, um, so, you know, there are certain things that I discovered that were very specific, like, uh, for example, um, uh, Japan had been firebombed so completely that by the time they dropped the Trinity test, the, 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 the people, the military people were saying to the scientists, if you don't get that bomb, we're not gonna have any place to demonstrate it because Japan has been decimated by just regular old firebombing. They wanted the bomb not only to defeat Japan, but that the military were already looking at the Russians as the next enemy. And so part of the push to get the bomb was to demonstrate to the Russians, don't think, don't get any, any ideas 
gear that mm -hmm. you're going to come out of this war on par with us because we have this weapon that you don't have. Um, so, I mean, there were so many things that surprised me that astonished me and I tried to get them all in the book. <laughs> Was there anything in your final novel that sort of uh, ended up on the cutting floor, so to speak, that you would have loved to have kept in? Well, you know, the thing about being a director and a screenwriter is it's very, you know, I've spent so much time in the editing room thinking, you know, it, I, <laughs> I don't want people to walk out like, you know, there's an engine to a story and you really, you want to grab people and you want them turning pages or as, you know, sitting at the edge of their seat. And so I'm kind of ruthless. I might be more ruthless than an editor about pace, pace, you know, keep the action going. And there was a scene that I wrote. It was one of the first scenes that I actually wrote. Um, it was a scene that describes how Hannah gets to Lo gets recruited to Los Alamos. And I was very, I loved the scene, but when I was talking with my editor, she was asking about it. And I suddenly thought, maybe I just don't need that scene. And she, she kind of agreed. We didn't really talk about it that much. I made it, I mm -hmm. cut it and it seemed to be fine, but then recently people people have sort of said well how did hannah get to los alamos and i'm like i know exactly how she got there there's this fabulous scene maybe i should just put it back so if there's another edition of the book that scene is definitely going to make it make its way back into into the book it was me being a little too ruthless and a little too much of a director i think mm -hmm. sometimes sometimes you can breathe as you're telling a story, you know. Great. Um, I just want to uh, encourage the audience to um, write in some questions in the Q&A while we continue our conversation. Um, what would you like the audience to take away from this novel? Um, and what does Hannah's life or Dr. Meitner's life teach us? There's so many themes to your book um, and it's so compelling, but what, what rises to the top? Well, there's a very simple theme for me. Um, and that is that I really want people to believe that one person can change the world. Um, Hannah changes the world she really influences what happens in history. I was, I was actually talking with somebody today and we were talking about the fact that if the Germans had gotten the bomb, which was very much a possibility, I mean, that was, I should maybe back up and say that was one of the biggest surprises of the book we tell history from the point of view of, of where we are now. And it's not even in our thinking that the Germans would ever have gotten the bomb. But when Los Alamos was started, it was started because all the, the Jewish scientists and the emigre scientists that had escaped from Germany and Eastern Europe were terrified that Germany was so far ahead in terms of the research that it was a matter of maybe days before the Germans got the bomb. And Los Alamos was this huge, you know, government funded push to make sure that we got it before the Germans did. That was the whole justification for doing it. So the fact that that the Germans don't get the bomb it is in the book very much part of what Hannah is up to. You might not realize that right away, but it's it is and and I guess also this notion that it's not just one person who can change the world, but actually um, love 
because there are two love stories in Hannah's War mm -hmm. and both love stories, both love stories have an effect on history. I'll just say that. Um, and so actually the power of love ends up being more important, maybe more powerful than the power of destruction, which is of course the, the bomb itself and all the destruction it caused. Great. Uh, we do have a question from the audience. Um, what are the biggest differences between your fictional character and the real person? Mm. The biggest difference is that uh, Lisa Meitner never did go to Los Alamos. Um, a lot of the story that takes place in Germany is quite similar to what happened with Lisa Meitner. Um, but once Lisa escaped Germany, um, she ended up in Sweden where she pretty much remained during the war. They wanted her at Los Alamos very badly because she was brilliant. She was a genius. She had discovered nuclear fission after all, and she would have been a huge asset at Los Alamos. But she herself was very, um, she had an incredible moral compass. And part of what I loved about her and what inspired me so much was this idea that she, she believed that scientists have a duty to humanity and their duty to humanity comes before their duty to science. So she said it was very important to her that scientists contribute in a way that makes the world a better place. And so she was proud of the fact that she didn't work on the bomb. I believe that I honored that, um, mm -hmm. even though she, I bring her to Los Alamos, but I bring her there with a mission. And I believe that her mission and the end of the story, how she kind of uh, is able to hold on to her, to her truth, um, also honors Lisa Meitner's moral compass as well. Great, thank you. Um, another question, is Hannah being treated as an Austrian or a Jew by the US military and how does she see herself? Oh, uh, interesting. That's a very philosophical question. Well, so this is actually interesting because the military had Los Alamos was a military um, installation. It was, it, in fact, there are some very funny things, some of which I tried to work into the novel, uh, where Oppenheimer was going around and trying to recruit scientists to come work with him. And the scientists were saying things like, I will work on discovering the atomic bomb as a professor. I will not work on discovering the bomb as a military colonel. Um, so you had this push and pull where the military wanted the scientists to be members of the army and to have ranks and to wear uniforms. And the scientists were saying, no, I'm a scientist. I'm, you know, I'm not, um, I I'm not taking orders from, from the military. So there was this, it's, it's, it's a fabulous sort of, uh, cauldron of, of competing interests. And with Oppenheimer trying to balance, trying to keep the scientists working and on task while the scientists are saying, well, wait a minute, we wanna know what we're working on. And so Hannah and, and almost all of most important scientists at Los Alamos were either emigre, Eastern Europeans, Germans, and most of them were Jewish. So the military was treating all of them essentially as Jews. Um, mm, interesting. And, and most of them, I mean, because there's a wonderful documentary that I recommend to anybody who's interested in the subject called The Day After Trinity, uh, made by John Else, E-L-S-E. It's, it's older, but he was able to interview 
many of the inner circle scientists before they died. And every single one of them, German accent, Austrian accent, Hungarian, yeah. Czech. I mean, there isn't, except for Oppenheimer, there isn't an American in the bunch. So I'm, Richard Feynman was there, he's American. I, I don't mean to be flip, but, but you know, these were the great minds from across, around the world and not, not all of them were American, far from it. So Hannah is not that different from the other scientists in that respect. Um, how Hannah considers herself, I think that was the second part of the question. Um, she, I think, comes to identify herself more and more as a Jew, but not, not in a conservative religious sense, more in terms of what she sees as the heart of Judaism, particularly this notion of tikkun olam, to repair the world, to heal the world. I would say in the course of the story, she moves from being kind of obsessed with discovery uh, and, and um, not ego, but, but, but discovery and creation and, and really moves more toward a sense of what am I leaving behind what is my ultimate contribution? How am I helping the world to become a better place? And that is a very Jewish, in my mind, it's a very Jewish philosophy, tikkun olam. It's very, to me, it's very central to the way I understand it, Judaism. And so I think she does consider herself a Jew very much in that, in that sense. Great, great answer. Um, we've actually had a request. Um, if you could read a few sentences from the book, do you have a passage that comes immediately to mind? So we get a sense of the yeah, sounds like you do. <laughs> well, I love. I honestly love the Hannah's words. Um, so I think it's a good place to start. I don't have to introduce it to people and say, well, here's. Here's all the history you don't know. I'll just start at the very beginning. Great, thank you. They come for me at dawn, as I knew they would. I've slept in my clothes and I ask if I may step into my shoes. They allow that, but nothing else. They tell me to go outside and I do. Parked on the dirt road between my barracks and the laboratory, is a vehicle the Americans quaintly call a paddy wagon, an absurdly chipper term for the dank iron trolley that will transport me from Los Alamos to the prison at Fort Leavenworth, where I will wait again, not for long, I fear, for my perfunctory trial and inevitable execution. The chain reaction leading to my death has been accelerated by my own divided heart I see that now in a way I never could when all was theory. White chalk on blackboard, equations like pale bones scattered across scorched earth. The man I shouldn't have trusted latches the manacle around my wrist and affixes it to a hasp welded hard to the bench. I'll protect you, he says, with such earnestness it makes me smile. You're lying again. He glances over his shoulder sufficiently assured that no one can see us. He takes my face between his hands. I will protect you, Hannah, if I can. Great, thank you. Um, we have actually another interesting question. Um, speaking of uh, Hannah being in Los uh, Alamos, but were there differences between how Hannah's German colleagues treated her as a woman and how the American researchers or military intelligence officers do? Ooh. Yes, I would say that there are. Um, what I found out about Lisa Meitner in Germany, in Berlin, 
the real, the inspiration for Hannah, um, was was very very much what I used. She was she was so brilliant that she was kind of passed along in a way that no woman was. Um, so she was the only woman. Mm -hmm. And you see these great photographs of all these, you know, dark suited men with hats sitting in a, you know, in the steps of a big German institute. And, you know, just in the teeny tiny corner, if you look really carefully, there's this little woman, she was very petite. You know, she kind of looks looked like Ruth Bader Ginsburg when she was young, you know, very delicate, very pretty, but, you know, very small. And and you almost don't notice her. And I mean, that was it. She was she was given a lab in the basement that was actually a workspace for the janitors. It wasn't a proper lab. She was just uh she was she was treated terribly and she was overlooked really but because she was so brilliant her ideas kind of kept bringing her forward um when she gets to los alamos they respect her intelligence i mean you know she she has made these essential discoveries. So by the time she's there, her colleagues respect her enormously. Um, and they know how valuable she is to the, to the team. Certainly Oppenheimer does. Um, and there's a big point made of that in one of the scenes of, of the book. Um, so in a way at Los Alamos, she has earned a lot of the respect, but she herself, is no longer engaged in the science in the way that she was when she was in Germany. So that, you know, puts her at a little bit of a distance, not that other people necessarily notice, but she has such mixed feelings about what they're doing. And she sees the consequences of things that maybe her mm -hmm. colleagues don't see. And so that, that and the fact that she's a woman you know, puts a distance um, between her and everybody else who's there. Um, the book is, you know, it, the sort of engine of the book is the arrival of this OSS officer and his mission to find a spy. And Hannah is in fact, his prime suspect. So he sees her uh, in a completely different way. He sees her as at first a suspect, then a spy, and essentially as, as prey, uh, you know, the, the person he has to trap. And then he begins to fall for her. So his feelings are very complicated, complicated further by the fact that he has underestimated her and as he's interrogating her, unbeknownst to him, she's interrogating him too. And she's discovering a few things about him that he's been keeping secret. So she turns the tables on him at a certain point. And then he's kind of um, uh, almost helpless um, because she has, she's gotten to him um, in a way that he never expected she would, or indeed in a way he hoped nobody ever would probably. So again, trying to, I'm trying to avoid spoilers here, but I to give you a sense of how interesting and complicated this relationship is and how it sort of unfolds and takes twists and turns you don't see coming. Great, <laughs> um, thank you. Um, actually, another question just came in sort of going back to uh, Dr. Meitner, just wondering if any of the other characters in Hannah's family actually were character were family for Dr. Meitner. Um, so, uh, so Lisa Meitner never, uh, never got married. She never had children. Um, I do think that she and her partner, uh, Otto Hahn, um, 
who, you know, he's kind of the villain in my book because he got the Nobel Prize and he didn't mention her name in the acceptance speech, but they were very close. They worked together for many, many years um, and they were, you know, they were collaborators. Um, he was married. Um, I think that there may have been, I do think that kind of scientific collaboration is so intense that it's very close to a marriage, if you will. I don't know that they were in love with each other or anything like that, but I could certainly see in that collaboration and the, they, they wrote letters back and forth. I mean, they remained close really until he died. Even, even though she really called him out on a couple of things, including the fact that he hadn't acknowledged her when he accepted the Nobel Prize, but also she called him out on the fact that, and called herself out too. She said, you know, we both knew what was going on in Germany. We didn't wanna know, but we both knew uh, and she's referring to the camps. She's referring to um, all, all of the things that were happening to the Jews in Germany. And he did go back to Germany and he worked there during the war. She fled and she did not have anything to do with it. And she, she wrote a very scathing letter to him that, that I came upon later in the research. And I was glad for her because I kind of seen her as a little bit of a doormat. And, and then I read this letter and I thought, oh no, she, she was angry um, and, she, and she got it out. Um, so, but she, she was very close to her nephew um, and her nephew was also a physicist and her nephew was the one who, um, who sort of presided over her legacy. Um, and he, he wrote the inscription for her, for her gravestone, um, which says, essentially, here lies Lisa Meitner, a scientist and a humanist. Yeah. Wonderful. And I think the fact that humanist comes, is more important is, is actually really crucial. I think that's part of her legacy. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, thank you. Well, I have one last question. Um, do you um, anticipate translating Hannah's War into German? It has been translated. Really? Believe it or not, it wow. has come out just October 28th. It was published in Germany by Piper Verlag. It is under a slightly different name. It's called uh, Hannah's Ge Geheimnis, which is wow. Hannah, Hannah, Hannah's Secret. Um, but you can order it on Amazon um, in German. And so have at it, Germanophiles. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, was, I, I personally was very excited because I was told that um, the Germans don't generally buy a lot of American Holocaust stories. Um, I think they maybe feel that Americans have simplified the Holocaust story a little bit too much. I don't know. That's, that's a conjecture. But... Um, when they bought Hannah's War, my agent was actually really surprised. She said, you know, that's, that's, that means that they really like the whole, the complexity of the portrayal. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so um, I hope it's doing really well. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I, because I think it's, a, I mean, I think it's a really good story. And I think that I tried very hard to try to understand the complexity of what was going on in Germany so that it's not just seen in black and white. Mm -hmm. um, I tried to see everything in all of its, all of its many, many, many shades of gray. Well, that's exciting to hear. It's a very compelling novel and 
I think a story that's long overdue to be told. So thank you so much for a very enlightening conversation. And um, we really appreciate your time and um, thank you again. Thank you, thank you very much. So I just want to mention that for those of you in the Pasadena area, there are a limited number of signed copies of Jan's book that are now available at Roman's Bookstore, our official partner and bookseller for the 2021 Book Festival. You can also order the book at Roman's Bookstore, romansbookstore.com. Um, our next two events are virtual. Tuesday, November 16th at 12 noon, Rafi Berg will be discussing his book Red Sea Spies, the true story of Mossad's fake diving resort. He is the Middle East editor of the BBC News website and will be joining us from the UK. It is an unbelievably true story and fascinating story of the espionage operation to bring Ethiopian Jews to Israel. On Tuesday, November 30th at 7 p.m., Jonathan Santlofer will be discussing his latest and sixth novel, The Last Mona Lisa. This fictional book is based on the 1911 real life theft of da Vinci's Mona Lisa from the Louvre. He received the Nero Award for Best Crime Writer and the book was named People Magazine's Best Summer Book of 2021. We hope you'll be able to join us to either or both and again, thank you all for supporting the Jewish Book Festival and enjoy the rest of your evening.